they enrich uranium or they have reprocessed plutonium, they have the potential and the capacity to make the bomb, but they don't do it because it doesn't serve their security interests. Iran wants to reach that point so that it could use it as a deterrent, it could use it as a way of projecting power and gaining credibility among Arab you know, masses against Israel. And yet, in my opinion, Iran is not going to cross the red line because they don't want war. Professor Farring, thank you very much for giving us a moment of your time. We are, I'm very delighted to be here. And um, you had a great talk last night at UCLA, and thanks for giving us the opportunity to interview you. Um, I want to follow up on the conversation you had last night. And could you give us a broad strokes of um, uh, Iran's situation right now in Middle East in what's going on with Syria? From the very beginning of the Iranian revolution, one principle that Ayatollah Khomeini established, and it has continued to guide the present regime, is what they refer to as export of the revolution in a theoretical, you know, conceptual sense. That is to say, and when they say export of the revolution, invariably it has an ideology. It has an, that idea as the Shi'i version of Islam. Therefore, in the Middle East, wherever they find Shi'i groups, oft, often minorities, except for Iraq, engaging in any kind of political activity, they try to assist that group through, and also in areas where possible, they subvert the political order, as in the case of Iraq, in order to influence the politics of the region in favor of, of the Shi'is. It's very interesting that from in the, during the first decade of the revolution, Iran during the Iran-Iraq war, the regime was quite active in propagating the Shi'i version of Islam and claiming to be the leader of this Islamic awakening in the Middle East region. And here, because there was a historic animosity between Hafiz Assad of Syria and Saddam Hussein of Europe, it's interesting that they were both products of the Ba'ath Party, the party of rebirth, in Iraq and Syria. But given the autocratic nature of their culture, when Hafiz Assad said Ba'ath Party should unite the Arab world, what he really meant was that everyone should come under my command. And when Saddam Hussein said the Arabs should be united under the banner of the Ba'ath Party, he meant everyone should come under my command. And these two were each other's enemy. From the very, even though if you read the constitution of Syria under Hafiz Assad or today, and the constitution of Iraq under Saddam Hussein, they're virtually identical referring to the same ideological sources and so forth. So this animosity was there. When Iran-Iraq war began, which started in September 20th, 1980, Syria supported Iran. The only Arab country that supported, as a result of this support, there was closeness between Iran and Syria. And during the period, it was Syria that assisted Iran militarily in terms of intelligence as well as even military equipments because Iran was weak and faced uh, an enemy that was much stronger military. So this was the beginning of the relationship. Then at the end of the Iran-Iraq war, Iran was humiliated. And as I explained in my lecture yesterday, one important time line in the Iran-Iraq war was summer 1982, when the Iranian forces managed to expel Iraqi soldiers from Iranian territory, the Arab states were desperate to end the war because they didn't want to be involved in a conflict that would lead to disruption in oil export and a real problem for the economies and security concerns. But at that time, Khomeini thought he is winning 
And then he changed the slogan of the war to the road to Jerusalem goes through Karbala, which Karbala represented the ideology, and the road to Jerusalem means conquering of Israel, which was unbelievable because at that time I was actually involved during the first three months of the Iran-Iraq war. I was still in Iran working with Banisad. I was involved in the negotiations. That was the President Banisad. President Banisad. And one point that I really want to make is that when Olaf Palmer, the former Prime Minister of Sweden, came to Iran as representative of the United Nations to mediate the war. I knew him by name during the 60s and 70s in the anti-Vietnam War movement. I had immense respect for this man without having ever met him. So when he came, the first thing we told him, Said Sanjabi and I met with him and said, you know, nobody in this country about the war has anything to say except Khomeini. You should meet with him and try to make a case for ceasefire with Khomeini. But Khomeini did not grant him a meeting at all. So he went back and forth to Tehran and Baghdad twice, and he came back and said, you know, nobody seems to be interested in ending this war. And if Khomeini and Saddam Hussein are not going to realize that, this conflict is going to be protracted with immense human and material cost for both sides. This is unbelievable. He is saying this in February 1981. February 1981, about three months, which turned out to be the case. 42 countries sold arms to Iran and Iraq. 11 countries, including all five permanent members of the Security Council, sold arms to both sides. During this period, Iran and Syria developed a very t close relationship, even after Khomeini finally submitted to the, accepted the ceasefire six years later, altogether eight years of warfare. The, Iran and Syria continued their relationship, but Iran had very little resources to help Syria. And at that time, from 1990 to 2001, the idea of exporting the revolution came to a dead end. You don't, if you read their speeches and their claims, there is very little reference to the first decade of the revolution about this. But then 9-11 came and changed everything but this. So Iran then continue to support Syria because Syria is a country that for 40 some years a a, about a minority of 10 to 11 percent of the population who are the Alawite Shiites and they have some commonality. There are not 12 Shiites but nevertheless some commonality with the Iranians. They became gradually dependent on you. So Iran has given Syria based on estimates I have seen over seven billion dollars in military and economic aid, and also Syria has tremendously benefited from Iranian tourists, Zabvar, people who go religious pilgrimage to Zainab Begay. Zainab, Imam Hussein's sister, is buried in Syria. In the year before the civil war in, in uh, Syria began, 500,000 Iranians had visited Syria, and this was the pattern during the uh, 2000, the year of that, for about 12 years, this incredible, because Iran's economy was dramatically expanded as a result of the high price of oil, and the people associated with the regime were in control of a lot of money. So Syria was one place where they could go have fun at the same time, a religious. Yeah. So this is the nature of the, and then sh another highly significant importance of Syria was Iran. Iran was interested in assisting the Hezbollah in Lebanon. And Hezbollah in Lebanon, the only border before the fall of Saddam Hussein, Iran, it's Syria was immensely important. So all the military and economic assistance Iran gave to Hezbollah went through Syria. And then 9-11 came and Iraq ended up being controlled by the Shi'is who were very close to the Iranians. So when you look at Iran today, Iran is on land completely connected through Iraq to Syria to Lebanon. So for this strategic purpose of exporting the revolution and being the leader of 
the new Islamic revival movement. This was a fantastic gift the United States gave, however unintentionally, to the Iranians. And on the other hand, all the worries of Iran about the Taliban came to a quick end because it was... Uh, and the Iran, it's very interesting to remember that Iran assisted the United States both with respect to invasion of Iraq and invasion of Afghanistan to the extent that American military commanders thanked Iranian revolutionary guards for their assistance. The same, the United States used Iranian territory in order to enter particularly through the to Afghanistan from one side, one, one part of it. And in other words, there was convergence and confluence of interest between the Iranian regime and the Bush administration for very different purposes. But there was, and Iranians tremendously benefited from this convergence. And to this day, Iran does not want to lose Syria as an ally because it would disrupt its connection with, uh, with the Hezbollah in southern Lebanon and it would really be a serious defeat for Iranian uh, hegemonic uh, adventurism in the Middle East region. Could you talk about this aspect of Iranian hegemonic uh, adventurism or want to be a regional power? Yes, it, first of all to the extent that Iran wants to be a regional power, it didn't begin with this regime. The Shah had exactly the same uh, purpose. With Americans' help? With American help. So there, in order for Iran to be a major power in the region, alliance with the United States. In the you know, Iran was operating as, you, as the deputy sheriff of the United States in the Persian Gulf during the 1970s. So in a historical nationalistic sense, there wasn't much of a difference between the Islamic Republic and Iran. However, the Islamic Republic also had an ideology. And that ideology was not acceptable. It was even offensive to the Sunni-dominated in Arab countries. So their ide the ideological dimension of Iranian ambition and uh, the hegemonic, uh, I would say, in purposes was... Uh, to focus on the Shi'is, to focus on the Shi'is. But they could not dream that this purpose will be fulfilled by actions of the United States in Iraq. So, so now Syria, it's going through uh, turmoil, uh, in, in, uh, civil war that it has. Can you talk about the factions that they are involved? And, you know, we are very much confused about some factions are, uh, they call them is, uh, Islamism, you know, cons uh, uh, extremist Islamism, and they are factions that they are siding with Europe and uh, West and US, and they are factions that they actually want to get rid of the regime and bring a democratic regime in. Can you break that well, one apart for us? First of all, what the people in Syria, overwhelming majority of the people want is removal of the regime. But what they're opposed to doesn't really tell us what they want to replace it with. Very much like Iran, very much like what we went through. And regrettably and unfortunately, the same tragic situation that happened in Iran after 1979, that fragmentation of the leftist liberal secular forces due to a cluster of reasons having to do with ideology and political culture of not being able to realize that at this particular moment, protection of civil liberties should have the highest priority and we should support, work with all those people who want to institutionalize protection of civil liberties. They didn't do it. In Syria, there are, you have Islamists who do not believe in democracy, who think they have the truth and their opposition to Saddam Hussein is that he is not doing the right thing but they know the right thing. You have variety of Islamists. You have Islamists who identify with Turkey. They are pluralistic but Islamic like very much like freedom movement in, in Iran. You have leftists who have liberal, lib, liberal leftist nationalists that in the past the leftists they were either connected to the Soviet Union or following Maoism. They had some kind of coherent ideology. That is all gone. So even the leftists in Syria, very much like our own country, they have become completely fragmented. You know, it's, uh, 
When we talk about Islamism or Islam as an ideology in the Middle East region or in the Islamic world in general, we have to remember that we are not talking about a single set of ideas. A variety of people identify with Islam and interpret the text and the tradition differently. In Turkey, they interpret it in a democratic fashion, and the Turkish constitution and the political order allowed them to come to power through elections. And the most important thing about this winning is that they didn't defy elections. They didn't say one person, one vote, one time, as in the case of Iran. They remained committed to the democratic process. And in Turkey, even though the Justice and Development Party, which has an Islamist orientation in a very, I would say, pluralistic and liberal sense, but there is a solid minority, about 40 percent of the parliament are from political, secular political parties that disagree with them, but they are working together. But when we go, for example, to Iran, it turned out to be something very, in fact, the most radical, the most dogmatic and one-dimensional people because of Khomeini's popularity and charisma took over and they decimated other, I'm not even talking about the secularists, decimated including many clerics. The Iranian, no regime in Iran over the past 400 years has been so uh, uh, much mistreating clerics than this regime. No, no regime at all. So, so we were talking about Syria and the factions in Syria, so. In, uh, yeah. in Syria, again, when we talk about Islamism, it's based on everything we read, both in academic literature as well as journalistic. We have Salafis, we have Akhaban al-Muslimin, Muslim Brotherhood, we have liberal Muslims, very much like the next the freedom movement you know, in, in Iran, who are who nationalistic and pluralistic, and we have leftists, and we have liberals. In Syria, in all autocratic countries of our own region, sometimes the regime becomes corrupt and that corruption regrettably also has an impact on the opposition. So the opposition, really, this hatred of the other comes to dominate their mentality and the idea of what do we want to replace it with. The only conceivable way a country like Iran, a country like Syria, could have civil society could have democracy is through a coalition of these forces opposing to the establishment. Hafez Assad established Republican, hereditary Republicanism, like Ghazafi, like what was going to happen in North Korea, like what was going to happen in, in Egypt, which is incredible. Republicanism means popular sovereignty, political equality, majority rule. And then the father is the president and the son succeeds. <laughs> it's the same, or it's, even though the vocabulary is different, but the practice is the same. The name just changed. The name, exactly. <laughs> the name. So in Syria, we are faced with this incredibly complicated situation. The only conceivable way, the outcome of this devastating civil war could be positive is if these forces opposing to the regime accept to build a coalition and accept pluralism. And they come to say, we have to create a constitution that is based on consensus, not majority rule. A constitution that is based on majority rule is not a constitution. A constitution means it should embody every, we could interpret it differently through process, lawmaking, judicial decisions, you know, and all. So Syria is exactly, they are working very hard. They get together, they are constantly getting together these provisional government, various groups, but so far they have not been able to come up with the coalition that calls for a, a democratic transition. But that's their nature of their politics. It's not, I wouldn't use the word nature. It's the kind of political, culture, attitudes, or behavior that must change. Is that the one that dominates in the whole Middle East? It's, it is the most, there is the democratic tendencies, but they are not at all in the majority. In, a good example is Egypt. You know, Mohamed Morsi, in the first round of the presidential election, he received less than 25% of the vote, but there were 13 candidates. So the liberals and the leftists and the secularists were so completely fragmented. 
that he ended up becoming the president. And at the end, he had to compete with another candidate who represented Hosni Mubarak. So many people voted for him with incredible uh, disgust. disgust. <laughs> but I said, what, what else could we do? But here, I would really genuinely believe that it was the fault of the Egyptian progressive forces not to create a coalition. So at this moment, right now, it's protection of civil liberties because sometimes the Islamists believe in democracy in order to come to power, and they abolish it as soon as they're in power. You know, I want to come <laughs> back to this part, but uh, let me continue with Iran before we go elsewhere, and that is uh, the Green Movement. Um, Talk about the Green Movement and uh, what has it accomplished so far? First of all, the leaders of the Green Movement came from the regime. And at this, in the, pub in the public positions, they continue to say that they are committed to the Constitution, they are committed to Velayat Tafari or the supreme leader of the absolute ruler of, of the clerics and all that. And yet, the Iranian regime, like other autocratic regimes, leftists or rightists and all that, the individuals who entered the regime with idealistic purposes, they really think that they do know the truth. You know, in politics, anybody who thinks they know the truth and they want to create heaven on earth, they end up creating hell on earth. You know. right. <laughs> it's right. as a general proposition. So here, it may well be that a good number of these people went through metamorphosis, went through transformation. Many of the hostage takers regret what they did today. And yet, Green Movement, people who supported it, they were the people who categorically rejected the regime. But this was the only possibility that they could express themselves and try to create some change. Not because they approved of the public positions of Kadrubi or Musavi, but Kadrubi and Musavi were confronting the most dogmatic characters. So the Green Movement, it's the reason for its creation seemed to be the, a rigged election. But it's the spirit of this movement, or the continuation of this movement at this in Iran, it, it had much more to do with the people who rejected the regime in its totality than the people who thought Kadrubi or Musavi should be the president and continue the same. It was very much like Khatami. People who voted for Khatami in 1997, if you remember young people, women, liberals, leftists, they thought in the context of this situation our best choice is even if we could chip away in this dogmatic system. So the Green Movement, I would say, I put the leadership aside because the leadership is really contaminated with they are not going to lead the country. And yet it led to a kind of understanding that this regime is not going to bend, this regime is not going to accept reform because this, it's not possible for the Islamic Republic of Iran to reform itself and remain Islamic Republic of Iran. It's not possible. So one of the slogans that was in the um, Green Movement was na Gaza, na Lebanon. Uh, na, no Gaza Strip and no Lebanon. That meant the, the, the Green Movement didn't want a government to be assisting the, um, uh, 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 the governments in, in Palestine or in uh, Lebanon. Can you talk it's about really, this, the contradiction? I, I would say overwhelming majority of the Iranian people uh, sympathize with the cause of Palestinians. No question about that. But it doesn't mean that they have to engage in arming them. And we, the, we could support the Palestinians through legal means, joining many other countries you know, in the world. So it's that uh, slogan symbolized the opposition of the Iranian people to this export of revolution ideology. That was that we are a country first and foremost we have to respond to the needs and aspirations of our own society. And of course, we have to serve the cause of justice, the cause of fairness. We have to support the legal system through the existing institutions of the world, not through war and violence, because we cannot be effective, period. So in that sense, it was really a way of saying a support for nationalism, support for pluralism 
support for uh, the needs and aspirations of the Iranian society. It didn't really mean that people opposed even the Shi'is of Lebanon for centuries. They were discriminated against. But Iran has transformed them into a military force that could be a threat to the security and welfare of the country of Lebanon as it happened in 2006. This devastating war in southern Israelis attacked it. One could criticize the Israelis, as I have done all my life, and yet the Palestinian the Hezbollah, with the help of Iran, provoked them because they benefit from this confrontation. In general, anyone in the Middle East who criticizes Israel uses incendiary language against Israeli treatment of Palestinians is going to have some popularity among Arab masses. Ahmadinejad would be exactly. <laughs> Because they're frustrated, they're humiliated. Israelis are territorially expanding. They have the superior force. They, they can defeat. So, uh, and yet their own respective governments in Kuwait or Saudi Arabia or Jordan do not seem to be taking a sufficiently a strong position against Israel. In this sense, for Ahmadinejad, it doesn't cost anything and it doesn't solve any problem, but in the short run, it satisfies the frustration and the humiliation of the people and it produces a kind of popular sentiment for him. But is this popular sentiment translated into anything tangible for the Arab people, for the Palestinians, or for the Iranians? Absolutely not. In fact, the negative consequences are immense. Sanctions, isolation of Iran, economic sanctions. So sometimes in politics, if you say you sacrifice, and as a result of your sacrifice, you're gaining something, at this, you said there is, there is this, um, the equation, there is this part. But in the case of Iran, it's all cost and there is absolutely no tangible benefit either to the Iranian people or to the Palestinians. Yeah, well, Iranian people are suffering the most right now from absolutely. the sanctions. Global Voices for Justice is a nonprofit media organization. Our mission is to bring to you independent thinkers and analysts who enhance our understanding of the world we live in. Your financial support enables us to achieve our mission. With a minimum $12 contribution, you will receive a copy of this talk. Thank you.